All right, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. We are so excited to have everyone here for today's webinar. Our guest speaker, Dr. Jason Hutt, will be discussing comb beam CT in veterinary and veterinarian dentistry and oral and maxillofacial surgery. My name is Amanda, and I'm gonna kick us off with some introductions. We wanna start off by acknowledging our co-sponsors, Dental Focus and the Animal Dental Training Center. We appreciate all the support we have received from Jim Merritt and his team at Dental Focus, as well as Dr. Hutt and his team at the ADC. As we venture into veterinarian spaces, having influential leaders such as them by our side has been amazing. For those of you who aren't familiar with osteoid, we are pioneers in the dental 3D imaging space. Our InVivo software was created in 2004 under the company name Anatomage. Since then, InVivo has become the standard in the 3D dental imaging world. In recent years, we've expanded to include veterinary and dentistry and other specialties in the veterinary space, and we continue to do so. Our guest speaker, Dr. Jason Hutt, graduated as a member of the charter class of St. George's University College of Veterinary Medicine in 2003. He received his bachelor's degree from Tufts University in 1997. Dr. Hutt joined the Animal Dental Center as a resident in dentistry and oral surgery in July of 2016 and completed his training in 2019. He's a diplomat of the American Veterinary and Dental College and an associate instructor at the Animal Dental Training Center in Towson, Maryland. Prior to joining ADC, Dr. Hutt spent 13 years in small animal general practice as an associate veterinarian in Liverpool, New York, a suburb of Syracuse. His professional interests include dentistry, oral and maxillofacial surgery, and three-dimensional imaging. In his spare time, Dr. Hutt is an avid woodworker, downhill skier, and a certified dive master. He also enjoys spending time with his wife, Lauren, and son, Jake, and they share their home with an orthodontically challenged Cavalier King Charles Spaniel named Hank. It's my pleasure to pass it over to you, Dr. Hutt. Before I do, and we are gonna have everyone muted on the webinar today, but please jot down any questions you have throughout the webinar and we'll save some time to get to those at the end. And without further delay, Dr. Hutt, it's all yours. All right, can you see my slides? Yes, sir, looks good. All right. Great. Well, thank you for that introduction. Uh, it does make me feel a little bit old, but uh, <laughs> I guess <laughs> it has been a while since I graduated from undergrad. Um, I appreciate everybody coming out on this, you know, Tuesday night to uh, talk about, you know, comb beam CT and dentistry and oral surgery. Um, you know, I am uh, one of the associates at the Animal Dental Center, and I'm an instructor at the Animal Dental Training Center uh, here in Maryland. Um, our practice is a four-office practice in Maryland and Pennsylvania. Uh, we have uh, currently have eight doctors, uh, three of them are residents, and we see probably somewhere around 2,500 um, dentistry and oral surgery cases a year. Um, we just added our third comb beam CT, uh, which should be going into our new Towson office, which is slated to be finished with construction in the next couple of months. Um, so it gives us a lot of opportunity to, to see cases uh, and use this modality. Um, we added our first comb beam CT uh, two years ago. Um, and so um, I'll start by saying I'm not a radiologist um, and uh, I'm not a physicist. I'm not an, an, an expert on, on imaging per se. Uh, so most of this is really coming from our experience of, of, you know, picking a comb beam, implementing it, and trying to learn how to use it effectively uh, in, the, in the dentistry and oral surgery space. So hopefully that'll be some useful things. Um, again, um, you know, we're sponsored by Osteoid and Dental Focus, um, and uh, I work for the Dental Center and the Training Center. Um, I um, I don't receive any compensation from osteoid or dental focus. In fact, 
Uh, we actually bought all the products we use from those guys. So they, they receive compensation from me, I guess, um, <laughs> purchasing these products. So, but we like to talk about the products that we like to use. Um, and so they're going to be featured in here because it's literally what we use. So we're going to start talking a little bit about, you know, well, what's the difference between cone beam CT and conventional CT? And again, I'm not a physicist. I'm not going to get into the the, the science of it, but from the from my perspective and how I look at, at those different modalities, uh, the cone beams are great because they have a really quick capture time. Uh, they don't use a ton of radiation compared to a conventional CT. They have excellent hard tissue detail, which makes, you know, which makes us as dentists happy, right? You can see the teeth, you can see the bone. Um, they're great for multiplanar reconstruction. Um, and so that is one of our big tools when we're using the cone beam. And we'll talk about what that is and how it works. Um, they're cost effective. They it definitely cost less to have and maintain a cone beam CT versus compared to a conventional CT. Um, the fact that they are uh, relatively quick um, to capture and things like that means you can do a lot of them and you can make the cost um, reasonable um, and do it on every case or almost every case. Um, a lot of these units are mobile and so you can actually bring them into your OR um, or bring the patients to them or some combination of the two, uh, which is not typical for uh, conventional CT. Drawbacks um, is, you know, is we definitely don't get the kind of soft tissue contrast that you get from a conventional CT. So when you're looking at soft tissue, particularly for you know, tumors and oncologic surgery, uh, we don't get the kind of soft tissue detail. I have an asterisk because there are some some things in the in the in the field that are that are getting in, you know, improving as far as soft tissue, but traditionally cone beef doesn't have great soft tissue density or soft tissue resolution. Um, and the field of views are relatively small compared to a conventional CT, uh, although that can be addressed with both um, mechanical stitching during capture, so kind of moving the patient um, or um, you know, using multiple scans and then stitching them together uh, digitally afterwards. So conventional CT is just really good soft tissue contrast uh, compared to cone beam, and they still have really good hard tissue resolution. So, um, you know, I think sometimes the detail may be not quite as good, um, but it's still very good. So you kind of get sort of the best of both worlds with a conventional CT. The downside is the machines cost more money. They cost more money to run. They're usually fixed. It's harder to have them in the same building as you. As a, as a dental practitioner, although um, you may be able to have that, um, they use more radiation. And in many cases, they are set to do thicker slices. Um, and so they look really good in the transverse sections. But when you try to start looking at them in, in, in multi-planar, so trying to look at them from different angles, um, that detail um, isn't there. Um, they're very dependent on patient positioning um, you know, because they rely heavily on, on a single view that uh, and so if you don't get them in the machine straight you know if the, if there's problems there it's it's harder to fix um, in, in when you're looking at the scans so this is a cone beam ct um, this is um, done on our our machine and uh, this is viewing it in the in vivo 7 software uh, in the multiplanar reconstruction um, so this is a cat. Um, this was captured in a bone window. So uh, we'll talk about that a little bit more um, in a minute. And the, the notable things are really just the really sharp bony detail. You can see the fine detail in the turbinates and things like that. Um, but not a lot of soft tissue differentiation, right? The orbits are just kind of big black holes. You can't uh, discern uh, a lot of the soft tissue structures. Um, this is a conventional CT, um, also an NPR. So basically a DICOM stack from a conventional CT put in under exactly the same settings as the cone beam. So this is a different cat. Um, this is an older CT and CT has come a long way just like everything else. And so the quality of images certainly can get better and better. And this may not be the greatest CT, but if we look in this sort of uh, transverse view, um, you know, we've got actually really good hard and soft tissue detail. Everything looks good. But then we go to the um, the compiled NPR views. So when we look at from the other angles, it, things start to look really pixelated. You can really kind of see the slice thicknesses. 
And then the 3D uh, rendering is also a lot less clear. Um, you know, if we go to a 3D, like a specific 3D rendering. So on the left side, we have the Combeam CT, really, really good detail. Um, and this is a, a bone setting for 3D. So it really kind of gives you the, it highlights the, the heart tissues. You get really, really good detail, um, you know, really good texturing. You can really see what's going on. And then over here, this is the same cat as before uh, in a in a 3D rendering, very similar. You can see the slice thicknesses, right? You, you can see the loss of detail when you look at it in other directions. And, you know, sort of the sagittal view is much, much grainier. It looks a little bit better uh, when we look at the... Um, and when we look at it from the front, because that's where the, the that's where the conventional CT shines. Um, so that's some of the the obvious differences when you're when you're looking at these scans um, in in sort of quality and, and detail. So soft tissue chromium CT um, is um, is sort of a, a newer version of cone beam CT. This varies by manufacturer. So um, a few different manufacturers are going to offer a soft tissue window or a soft tissue algorithm. And these tend to be um, longer scans. Um, they use more radiation and they give you better soft tissue contrast. Uh, and so they're really useful when you're trying to look at soft tissue, you know, uh, retrobulbar things, when you're trying to look at, at tumors and things like that. If you wanna use injectable contrast, it's much more effective if your comb beam has a soft tissue window or soft tissue algorithm, does a little bit better job of differentiating those soft tissues. Um, in my experience, we typically end up taking two. Um, we'll do a, a typical bone scan that really highlight the hard tissues, and then we will um, inject the contrast and run the soft tissue scan um, and uh, to, to highlight the injectable contrast if we're using it or to highlight the soft tissue. And between the two, um, you tend to get a pretty good idea of what's going on. Uh, versus, you know, a conventional CT where you kind of do the same scan with and without injectable contrast. So again, the the soft tissue scans are better than the than the than the straight up plain comb beam scans, but the, I, I don't think any of them have quite reached the level of of um, contrast that you're going to see with a you know with a good conventional CT. Um, so they're sort of somewhere in the middle. So this is a um, Two scans side by side. This is the same cat. On the left side is the is the bone window, um, and this is a transverse view. On the right side, you have the soft tissue window with injectable contrast. Um, and so this um, cat came in for a um, retrobulbar abscess, or we think an abscess. It had uh, exophthalmus and pain. Um, you can see in the contrast view, you've got a, a rim of contrast enhancement around the structure in the orbit. The, the globe is displaced. If we look back at this, literally this is the same slice in the, in the bone window. I mean, if you know it's there, you can kind of make it out. You can kind of see that the position of the orbit's out, but the, the detail is very, the soft tissue detail just isn't there. Um, but then we look at the bony detail. So on the, on the, the bone window side there, you can see the, you know, the trabeculi in the bone, you've got much more detail, whereas on the soft tissue side, um, you're going to see things are much, much, the bone is actually kind of overexposed and, and it loses its detail. Um, you also use different um, window leveling. So you use different adjustments of contrast and brightness and things like that um, for the different scans to kind of highlight the soft tissue versus the hard tissue. But when viewed together, um, you get a lot of useful information. And this is where the, the soft tissue comb beam can be really useful. Um, and again, the soft tissue scan you know, takes 40 seconds versus the bone scan takes 20 seconds. So it doesn't add a ton of time to your procedure. And then if we look side by side here. We're back to that the transverse view of that conventional CT uh, on the left there. And you actually have you know, pretty good soft tissue and bony, and then there's no contrast in that. So again, it's a different cat, different problem, but you can see the lenses, you can see um, the different structures in the orbit and the eye. So you can really see that soft tissue contrast. And I think, you know, newer, um, better conventional CTs would probably have even higher resolution. 
So how do we capture a cone beam study? Um, typically, we're going to want general anesthesia in most cases. Um, they are quick studies, but there's, you know, they're still sensitive to motion. So um, typically, we have the patient under general anesthesia. Um, to help reduce motion, things like a little bit of manual hyperventilation, so you can, um, you know, breathe for them and get their end tidal CO2 down a little bit, which will give you a, a brief period of apnea when you stop, which can actually give you a nice clean scan. Um, if that's not working, sometimes just a small bolus of whatever your induction agent was to kind of get you that brief apnea and then start breathing for it again. Again, it's typically less than a minute, 20 seconds, 40 seconds. Um, and so that can be a very um, you know useful way to get your scan. There are some times when, you know, just heavy sedation or, you know, just some inter quick intravenous anesthesia, you might get away with it. Um, you know, animals that can't open their mouths, things that you, you, know, you can't intubate right away. Um, sometimes you can get away with um, scanning them, um, you know, without having to do a tracheostomy and things like that to kind of figure out what's going on so you can make your surgical plan. So um, sometimes you can get away with heavy sedation, uh, but it is somewhat sensitive to motion. So again, most of the time you could do these in sternal or dorsal recumbency. Um, some of these uh, scanners, the one we use actually has a closed end, so it's not through and through. So everything has to that goes into the opening of the scanner has to come back out. So using uh, a J-style endotracheal tube to direct the, the, the tubes back out of the CT or using um, an elbow fitting or even a couple elbow fittings will kind of help to, uh, to kind of keep everything kind of coming out of the machine. Uh, some units do have a through and through design, so you can kind of pass the tube, you know, through the machine and have the anesthetic um, machine on the other side. Uh, it just depends on the design of your machine. So we do most of ours um, sternal. Um, so the animals typically will get induced um, at the, the cone beam. Um, they're placed in sternal recumbency. You can see we've got actually two elbows. Um, which does add some dead space. The anesthesia purists, I'm sure, are appalled, um, but it's only briefly and, you know, with a little bit of um, assisted ventilation, we don't see too many problems from that. Uh, and again, these, these scans are short. Once they're in the machine, you usually have um, a set of lasers that are going to help you line everything up, um, and they will give you in this case, the a midline and then the field of view, sort of a, for, a rear and a forward. Um, ours has an extra line in the middle that indicates that where the highest resolution in the field of view is. So if you really have an area of interest, you can focus on that. And these lasers are pretty accurate. Pretty much where you put them on the pet is what's going to get scanned, uh, which is really nice. So when you put them in there, you can see this cat's really crooked. So then we're going to straighten them out and see that that laser goes right up midline. Everything is nice and squared up. Um, the really nice thing about cone beam CT though, is that positioning is great and our technicians are wonderful at getting these animals straight and square, but because everything is isotropic, everything has is in the same direction, you can actually adjust for, for problems with positioning in the, in the software later. So the positioning is not nearly as important um, for a cone beam as it is like for a conventional CT where you, where you, you know, you don't typically use NPR and you can't adjust things. So this is what the machine looks like. So we typically have an operator that's, um, you know, controlling the machine. We have a second person that's, you know, monitoring and managing anesthesia. The anesthetic monitor is visible by the person operating the machine. We have our cone beam set up in its own room with lead shielding just for additional safety. These actually do produce relatively low emissions. Um, so it, depending on where you live and what state, you don't always have to have them in a lead lined room. And then typically the, um, the anesthetist will step out um, for the you know 20 or 40 seconds while the scan's running. The operator, um, the position where they stand is actually shielded by the machine so they can stand there while it runs and keep an eye on the monitor um, while they operate the machine. And then as soon as it's done, the um, the anesthetist can come back in and uh, continue to monitor the patient. So we're using a Zoran VetCat IQ. Um, Dental Focus has, has sold us two of these now, and we have one of the original VetCats. Um, it offers this 20 second bone scan. That's the one we use most of the time. The resolution is 0.3 millimeters um, for each slice. It also has the 40 second soft tissue scan. 
that we can use with, you know, with contrast and things like that. We've talked about there's a number of different manufacturers that have soft tissue algorithms. There's a number of just plain um, traditional comb beams, you know, CTs at various price points and stuff like that. Um, we researched or I got to research a number of them uh, before we purchased our first one. And this was the best fit for us for size, um, portability, as well as um, you know resolution and cost. It actually um, is not the most expensive one and it has some of the highest resolution. So, um, so we like it. Uh, again, I don't get paid by Zoran to say that. I mean, this is the machine we bought. So there's obviously something we like about it. Um, so every machine, this machine comes with its own um, intrinsic software for viewing and interpretation. Um, and then also the, the scan or the study, once you create it, can be exported either as a DICOM. Zoran has their own proprietary file system as well. It's a little bit smaller to store. So you can either store it on the machine and look at it on the machine, or you can export it into your PAC system uh, as a DICOM and use any DICOM viewer um, to look at it. Um, and that's useful because, you know, again, these machines are really, really fast, but interpretation could take time. In our offices, we usually have at least three tables. So we might have two or three doctors working all using the same machine. So I can't stand at the machine and look at my scan for 20 minutes because the next patient needs to use it. So we need to get those scans exported and, uh, and look at them on a different workstation so that we can maximize our use of this you know, piece of equipment. So viewing software is kind of how you do that. So again, every every software or every machine is going to have its unique proprietary software, and and you need that because that's how the the machine captures the um, you know captures the study. And most of them are going to be um, very appropriate for viewing and interpreting. Um, they're all going to have different features. Uh, some of them do use proprietary file types, um, and um, you know, that, that they can read, and then all of them can export them as DICOMs, which can be used by any, you know, DICOM medical imaging viewer. Most of the time when you buy one of these machines, you get one license, right? It's the one on the machine, and you have to stand there at the machine if you want to use it. Um, if you, you know, sometimes you can negotiate for additional copies um, to have on other machines, or you can think about a third-party viewing software. Um, some software is designed to only run on specific hardware. So I know there's one manufacturer, when I asked about extra copies, you had to buy a laptop from them um, was the only way to get additional copies of their software. So um, there's different ways to do it. Um, and um, so you really have to look at not just buying the machine and getting the software on the machine, but also where are you going to use this software? How many copies do you need? What kind of machines do you need to run it? And where are you going to interpret it? How are you going to read? Do you, do you want to be able to sit at a desk? Do you want it chair side when you're working? You know, all those kind of things. And so those are questions to ask um, because sometimes additional licenses from the manufacturer of your, your home beam might actually cost more than a good third party viewer. Um, you know, it might be less. And then, you also want to make sure that whatever viewer you're using, can you look at studies from other machines? Because if you are a specialist that is, takes referrals, sometimes they come in, they've already been scanned. Someone else did a, a conventional CT or an MRI or an other type of imaging. And, you know, as specialists, we need to be able to look at those too. And so being able to look at it all in one software is really attractive because you only have to learn how to use one software and, and you can get good at it versus having to look at different scans on, you know, on different programs, um, which can take more time to learn. Um, so third-party viewing softwares, I think probably the most popular ones. So in vivo seven by osteoid, that's what we use. Um, and we ended up, um, you know, purchasing licenses kind of shortly after we got our first cone beam, um, uh, Horus, um, or Osiris X. Those are, that's a Mac only one. Horus is actually open source. So it's free. Uh, if you're, if you're a Mac platform, um, and it's pretty powerful, I not being a Mac user, haven't tried it. Um, Radiant is another open source one you can get to look at, um, for diacoms and stuff like that. And I think it's a pretty passable viewer. I think, um, you know, of those three, those are the most common ones I'm familiar with in vivo definitely works the best for us. Um, we used to use Radiant View um, for just whenever we had, you know, 
CTs or conventional CTs that, that came in from other practices and things like that. And it was okay. Um, I'm told that in human medicine, there's like a specialty software for like every specialist. If you're a periodontist or an endodontist, stuff like that, if, or you know, there's a lot of different specialties, there's a lot of different softwares. Um, and that just goes to show that, you know, third-party software allows you to figure out what options are important to you and your practice and like how you want to look at these studies and then kind of get what you need. Um, and many of them, you know, can look at other types of 3D imaging. So, you know, if the neurologist wants to share the MRI or it already had a conventional CT, things like that, you can throw those into the same software that you look at your cone beams and be very comfortable manipulating them and, and you know, kind of moving between them. So that's one of the things that's really nice about third-party software is it often is very flexible. So how do we go about reading? And, and again, we don't have time, you know, today to talk about all the ways in which we can all the, the, the nitty gritty details of reading. Um, and, um, but in broad strokes, um, you know, most of these cases are coming into, you know, we're, we're a dental practice. So they're coming in for the evaluation of oral and maxillofacial structures, teeth, jaws, TMJs, associated soft tissues for periodontal disease, endodontic disease, um, you know, tumors and trauma, you know, things like that. But when you scan them, you're going to get the whole head, right? So you're going to get the ears, you're going to get the eyes uh, and structures that may be, um, you know, you're, you're not your area of expertise, especially not if you're a dentist. So um, ears have sort of become the bane of my existence because there's all sorts of asymptomatic pathology you're going to find when you start scanning lots of animals. Um, and so, you know, having a relationship with a radiologist so that you can kind of farm out the other stuff or the stuff that's not your area of expertise is, is um, very helpful. Um, we found that, you know, when we were trying, trying to find someone to do that, that not all radiologists are super excited about cone beam studies. Um, and, and it took us a while to find a radiologist that would, would read those studies for us. Um, and even when we did, a lot of times, um, I don't think radiologists will read out the, the teeth or read out the level of periodontal disease and, 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 and dental structures and stuff the way that a dentist would. So, um, you want to, you know, talk to them and find out, you know, are they, are they looking at the teeth or, you know, if you're a dental specialist or if you're doing this for dentists, that, that might end up being your job, right. To make sure that you read out the teeth. And I think for most of us dentists who do cone beam, we kind of presume that we're going to read out the teeth and, and kind of leave the rest for the radiologist. But if you're a general practitioner that's thinking about getting into cone beam or you have one, um, just make sure, you know, whoever's reading your studies, are, you know, are they comfortable reading out? the teeth and, and, and giving you a good read on them um, because the, I don't think that's always the case. Um, so, um, and then I think a systematic approach um, is going to give you the best results is, is figure out a way to read your studies and read them in the same way every time. Um, and um, the same way we read dental x-rays in the same way you read, you know, conventional radiographs and things like that. So the way we do a systemic is we're going to try to do things, you know, the same way every time. So window leveling is basically how we're going to adjust bright, brightness and contrast to best highlight the relevant anatomy. Um, and so a lot of your software will have preset levels. Um, and so you can kind of say, oh, I like this one. Sometimes they're named and, and in vivo. They have like a dental and abdomen. You know, they have ones for different body parts that will highlight the, the structures. And then they have custom levels that you can save, you know, if you want to tweak it to get it the way you like it, and then save it um, for your preference or the other doctors in your practice preference. Um, and even you might have different presets for different scanners. So if you work with, with you know, more than one machine, you may have a very different preset for one manufacturer's cone beam versus another. So that they all look a little bit different. Um, you know, we work with a, a, another machine that doesn't belong to us um, that we sometimes have the, the surgery and, and internal medicine services that we work with will we'll scan for us. And, and those will look quite different and, and we'll use different window leveling to kind of try to see what we need to see. So you have to think about the machine as well as the software. Um, and they're both going to you know, affect what it looks like. And you have to be careful because window leveling can really enhance or obscure pathology or just sort of, you know, trick your eye or your brain and how you interpret. So you want to make sure that you're looking at things the same way um, so that you don't miss things. Um, probably, you know, 
more so than than almost any other modality is is you have a lot of ability to kind of change things up. So this is just an example. This is the same image with a whole bunch of different levels. Um, what the the crazy colors and stuff are in there for? You know, these are just presets. So obviously the the ones are on the outside. You have different varying levels of contrast and brightness that will highlight or 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 hide things or make things easier to see. And then you know if if you want to make abstract art and print it out and frame it, then you've got some of these other ones that uh, um, are, are built into, you know, the software for, for whatever reason. So, but you can make it look a lot of different ways and that will affect your interpretation. So you have to be aware. Sharpening is not just for, you know, curettes and, and scalers and periosteal elevators. Um, so sharpening refers to the sharpness of the image, sort of the granularity or smoothness, smoothness. Um, you know, so there'll be a number of different degrees, you know, some softwares, you know, I think have like three different, some have five, so you can kind of make it smoother or sharper to your preference. Um, you know, if you get too sharp, you start to get a lot of artifact, a lot of granularity, like you see over on the right image. Um, some people like it smooth, some people like it sharp. I mean, it's, it's, you know, similar to, you get some of that in, in dental radiographs, depending on which sensor you use and things like that. Everybody has their preference, so you can adjust it to what works best for your eye and your, your brain for interpretation. Um, slice thickness. Um, so there is the, the sort of intrinsic slice, slice thickness that your machine is set on. And so for ours, the, the standard is 0.3, although we can do what's called an area of interest where we focus on a spot and we could take it all the way down to 0 0.07 millimeter slices. But when you view, you can also control how thick the slices are created um, when you look at them. Uh, and essentially what you're doing is you are superimposing multiple slices. So if you set the slice thickness at zero, on the left, that's just going to give you the thinnest slice that your machine generated. So in our case, 0.3 millimeters. As you get it thicker, you get more and more superimposition. So as you see, as we move from left to right, the image starts to look more like a radiograph because you're actually seeing more anatomy superimposed as the slices are stacked up. And that can help sometimes to, um, to really sort of outline a whole structure, sometimes looking at just one slice. You don't see the whole thing or you can't capture the whole root or structure in one image by making it thicker. It looks more like a very kind of focused, you know, radiograph. Um, and then you can get a better idea of um, you know, where things start and stop and the overall shape and size. So adjusting the slice thickness can be really helpful um, for those of us who you know are used to looking at dental radiographs, you know, making it look more like a radiograph sometimes kind of puts us back in our comfort zone, especially in the beginning when you're learning, um, is to kind of recognize things more potentially with a little bit more superimposition. So that can be a useful tool to help you learn, you know, look at the at the individual slices, but then also look at things um, with the slices thicker to give you a little bit more um, information. So um, multiplanar reconstruction is probably one of our most important tools. Um, and it, you know, it basically takes data from a series of two-dimensional sections. So the slices, you're basically your DICOM snap stack, your four, five, six hundred individual DICOMs that represent individual slices, and then it reconstructs that into a three-dimensional model that then you can look forward to back, side to side, top to bottom. So it's basically going to give you three different views that you can scroll through along the different axes. So most of the time, the source data is axial or kind of transverse, and then the 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 other sections, the coronal and sagittal sections, are created from that information, and so um, they're sort of generated. Um, all views are isometric, and and this is why NPR works so well in cone beam because it, it, no matter what direction you're looking from or what direction the slices are generated, all of the measurements are true. So you can draw a line in any one of the slices, or you could draw from two points um, and, and that line will be accurately measured um, throughout the study. Um, and, and you can carry those measurements over from one view to the other. Um, and by the same token, a point or any pointer or any axis that you can see in one view is carried over into the other two views accurately. So, so you can kind of see where you're at from, 
from multiple different views, um, which is um, which is really useful, um, especially for surgical planning. You know, if you're looking to you know remove a tumor or something like that, being able to see where it begins and ends from every direction will kind of tell you where to put your your cuts and things like that. And then a lot of times the, the Invivo does this. Um, some of the other softwares give you the option of having a fourth view, which is the three-dimensional rendering, which keeps the same um, pointer and the same axes on it. So you can just sort of spatially locate yourself. So if you're not quite sure where you are, you look at the 3D view and it will kind of tell you where you are um, on the on the pet and from sort of a gross perspective. Um, so this is a... Um, Again, this is an NPR. Um, we've got the um, the three different um, slice views, and then we've got the three dimensional in the bottom right corner. Um, here's where we get into something that's a little bit of a uh, little bit tricky as far as anatomy and and nomenclature is that th this software and most of these softwares were actually developed for human use. And when we talk about anatomy, right, dogs and people. Um, don't stand the same way. So, right, people stand on two feet and their face, they face forward, dogs stand on four feet, and so their head is at 90 degrees. So the software is labeled with the human terminology, which means that the axial view is kind of looking down the long axis of the body, um, which, you know, for the dog means you're kind of looking down on the top of the head. Um, and sort of like a DV or a VD view. The coronal view, again, for people, and that's how the software is going to label it, is kind of looking from, from front to back. So like a cranial caudal is what, what we're looking at with the dog. This is called the coronal. So that'd be kind of looking, looking someone in the face if this were a human patient. And then sagittal is sagittal. So, um, so that one's easy. And when we actually talk about the, the veterinary terminology, um, this one that's labeled axial in humans um, is actually called coronal because you're kind of looking down. And again, it's sort of that dorsal ventral or ventrodorsal, you know, would be the, the, the comparable, you know, radio, radiographic view. We call that the coronal view looking down from the, from the crown of the head down kind of a thing. Um, and then what they call the coronal view in people is actually the transverse. Um, and I think there's a lot of debate. Nobody's really formally um, kind of, you know, named and, and made a convention for, for, for talking about the, he the head in particular on CT. Um, and so it's a little confusing when you read the text and things like that. So a lot of times I just go with the software because I know what they're going to give me. It, it, it will label that top left one, the axial view, when you're saving the image. It'll label the bottom left one, the coronal view, um, and then the sagittal will be the sagittal. So, um, you know, we got to give the nomenclature people stuff to do, to argue about, to change. And this is one of those things I think that's that's still a little bit murky, um, or at least it was it was hard for me to, to define it well. Um, and then the software again is designed for people. So positioning, um, you know, we keep kind of coming back to it, but physical positioning will determine the position of the anatomy when viewed. We can adjust that in the software afterwards, but it is very important to tell your scanner what position you're using so that your markers are correct, right? If you're going from dorsal to sternal, your left and right will reverse, um, things like that. And if the, the machine, mislabels those things, your interpretation can be difficult. So you just have to make sure you tell the machine what orientation you put the pet in, get it as straight as possible. You can do, um, you know, scout views, which are two-dimensional x-rays to kind of see. But honestly, the laser positioning on, on these machines are so good that most of the time we don't need to do that. So we get them in as straight as we can and get the scan quickly. And then we can adjust in the software to get perfect orthogonal views, perfect symmetry, um, and so that initial alignment's a little bit less critical. Whereas in a conventional CT, if you put them in there crooked, you're not going to have symmetrical images. Um, I like to rotate every study to a standard orientation. So whether they were dorsal or sternal or whatever, I always line them up in the software the same way. So I'm always looking at them the same way, just like when you look at conventional radiographs, we kind of always put the head to the left and the same way we orient dental radiographs. So we put the teeth in the same orientation. 
Um, not everybody does that. So that's that's something I think is important. In the Invivo software, they actually have positioning shortcuts that rely on everything being kind of put in the same position to use them. And I like them. So that's the other reason that I do it. Um, so the shortcuts are kind of fun because you just click one button when you're looking at the 3D and it just puts it in. You know, you want to look at the left side. You want to look at the right side. Um, so here's where you say you've, you know, you've, You've done your study, you're looking at your first scan and everything's, a, you know, it's a little bit crooked, right? So we're a little bit rotated this way. The head's rotated in a couple different directions. We just use, we select the adjustment and then we can adjust the rotation. We use those little arrows and then we adjust it in all three views until everything's perfectly straight. And now we've got nice and straight. And I know it's straight because I've got wonderful symmetry, right? These Palatal roots of the M1s are exactly the same size. The canines are exactly symmetrical in every view. Even when I look at the 3D, and again, in this in vivo software, when you get this straight, it automatically positions the, the shortcuts. You can see the sort of perfect overlapping of the, of the um, superimposed teeth. Everything looks nice and square. So that kind of helps you know that you got it straight. And, and for me, having it nice and straight and having really good symmetry Mother Nature always gives you a guide on the other side, right? You can look for, for pathology. Um, and if you keep it nice and straight, it really helps to have these perfectly symmetrical images. And then this is just a blow up of the bar. These are the, um, you can see they're obviously made for people, but this is the shortcut. So I can click on that, it'll go to left lateral. I can click on this, it'll be right lateral if I wanna look from the front. Um, so that's a, a nice little feature in the in vivo um, that just saves some time, you know, putting it into kind of standard views. Uh, when you look at the 3D. So as part of that systematic evaluation, you know, we have three-dimensional, we have NPR and some other stuff. Um, so I like to start by looking at the 3D and I kind of think of that as my distance exam. So, um, and then I'll go to the NPR and then I'll go to custom sections and we'll talk about that in a minute. So in the 3D, so I'll go to the 3D and I will like, is simple stuff, right? Count the teeth, you know, look for malocclusions, look at the lengths of the jaws, look for gross asymmetry, trauma, you know, the kind of stuff that you see grossly. Cause you know, when you really start to go slice by slice, sometimes it, it's hard to see the, the forest for the trees. Um, and so I'll kind of start there. I'll look for really obvious things um, and, uh, and kind of mark those down on my chart. I then go through the NPR evaluation. So that's going to be slice by slice in each access. Um, I will warn you because 3D in particular is very subjective to exactly how much bone the, the, the software chooses to show it. Now, you really don't want to evaluate periodontal disease, bone loss, stuff like that in 3D. It tends to over-represent bone loss, whether the the software decides to to put bone or take it out you know we we're talking about very thin bone and things like that around the, the periodontal structures um and so it's very dangerous to try to do periodontal evaluation in 3d so use it for gross structures um when you want to look at things like bone height attachment loss periapical lucencies all that kind of stuff that's where the npr really shines is because you you know it's it's much more detailed and you can look you can you can make things bigger uh, and you can um, you can get a much better idea of you know subtle changes in 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 bone height bone density stuff like that that you can't really see on the 3d um, so that's where we do most of our work in the NPR uh, and really evaluating what's going on and then custom sections are individually generated views and I use them for specific anatomy um, you can actually use them to make things that look just like dental radiographs, uh, which is kind of fun, especially when you're first learning, you know, because they will look very familiar. You'll be very comfortable um, identifying pathology on them. Um, sometimes like the, the teeth that tend to be at sort of oblique angles. So like the mandibular canines, the incisors and things like that, they don't show up nice and square in the kind of typical orthogonal views of the NPR. So you can make custom sections to really look at them almost as if you're creating a perfectly parallel radiograph. So you can really see them exactly as, you know, in, in uh, the correct proportion and things like that. TMJs are wonderful to evaluate with custom sections. And then there's always the panoramic, um, which before we got the comb beam, I thought was gonna be really important. And now that we have it, I almost never use. Um, 
So this is a 3D view. Um, again, this is an, an in vivo thing. They have this nice bone and teeth mode that gives you sort of a, a see-through bone where you can see the teeth roots, tooth roots and stuff. This is a preset, which is really nice. So you want to say, hey, are the teeth there? Are they in place? Are they symmetrical? I mean, yeah, right. So we've got a, a missing permanent tooth and persistent deciduous tooth. So you can kind of see the, the broad things that sometimes are easy to, to, to get lost when you're looking at the real fine detail of the NPR. The clipping means that they have presets that allow you to look at half of the skull at a time. So this is cut in half sagittally, so it gets rid of superimposition. And I like that when I look at these lateral views, um, I take out the, the far side so that I'm not looking at superimposed teeth or teeth on the other side. So that's actually um, just the way I do it. I think it's really helpful. So I look at each side, um, just one half at a time. And then I'll get rid of the clipping and look at it from the front. Obviously, this dog's missing some incisors. She was class three malocclusion. She had some orthodontic things done when she was younger um, to, um, you know, give her a comfortable functional bite. So we'll look from the front. And then, you know, we'll move on to the 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 NPR, the multiplanar um, sections. Um, and that's where we're going to go through kind of slice by slice. Um, so these are, like I said, these are great for periodontal bone height. You know, these are, you can see most oronasal fistulas, even the ones that you can't really see on radiographs. You can kind of, you'll trace a path from the inside of the mouth into the inside of the nose where there's no bone. Um, periapical lucency, I was shocked to learn that the Chevron sign is still there in cone beam CT. So you have to still be cognizant of that, um, just like you are in dental radiographs. Um, and I, I thought, you know, cone beam showed you everything, but nope, you can still have some Chevron and, and have to interpret that. Um, you can look for ground fractures. You can look at root canal structure. Um, you can look for wide and pulp. You can measure, you know, to three tenths of a millimeter. You can see pulp exposure. Um, you can, you know, you know, slice the tooth just right to kind of see where that um, pulp is exposed to the outside. Another nice um, kind of fun trick is necrotic or absent pulp is usually much darker. So these these recently deceased teeth, these non-vital teeth that aren't damaged, that sometimes give us a real hard time. They don't have an appreciable, um, you know, asymmetry in their in their root canal, but they're black, you know, compared to the opposing tooth, which is more of a gray. And that can be a big tip off that that tooth is, is non-vital. Um, my own personal dog, when he was a puppy, we did a bunch of orthodontic things. You know, when he was six months old, he was a, had a class two malocclusion. When he came in at a year and a half for his first sort of annual, you know, cleaning and, and imaging, um, it was kind of right after we got the comb beam. So we we did the comb beam, and and I was looking at it with one of my colleagues, and and he was getting his you know his scaling and, and dental radiographs, and and we looked at these three mandibular incisors, and they looked a little bit darker, and we kind of argued for about ten minutes of whether they were alive and dead. And then, of course, when I sat down and he was all clean and I looked at him with my loops, those three teeth were obviously discolored. So sometimes you still have to examine the pet. You know, we, we weren't sure on the comb beam, but, you know, three brown teeth, they they were dead. Um, so um, you obviously have to remember to, to look at the whole, you know, the, your gross examination is still really important. And then changes in bone density or quality. So really useful when you're trying to figure out, you know, what is the extent of the, the tumor and things like that. And so if you have bony lysis and, and things like that, whether it's from, you know, infection, inflammation or neoplasia, um, uh, being able to identify exactly where that is so you know how far to treat and things like that is um, is very helpful in the, in the NPR. So here we have the NPR, we've kind of blown everything up. Um, and so we can kind of see the detail focusing on the jaws. Um, and then, um, so this little video kind of shows you, this is normally you do this with this, the scrolling wheel on your mouse at whatever speed you're comfortable with. And you can kind of see as we move through, um, you know, the, um, what the computer calls the axial or what, the, what we should call the coronal view as we go down up and down. This is a pretty healthy dog, but you can look at the periodontal ligament widths. You can see the tooth structure. Um, you, you can go through and, and, and see any changes in symmetry, discoloration, you know, stuff like that. And if you notice, as we scroll through there, the axes in the other windows are moving too. So that pointer, that cross represents the same point anywhere in the dog. So if, if you stop it, you'll know exactly where you are on the 3D as well as in the other views. Um, 
So, and then I usually will go, go through this coronal view first uh, and kind of look for changes, look for pathology. And then we can come back and we'll do the same thing. Um, we'll do it in the, um, in the transverse view. And so we're going to go front to back. And again, we can estimate periodontal bone height. We can look for fractured teeth. We can look for periapical lucencies. We can look for loss of bone density. Um, this video runs a little fast just for, for time's sake, but um, you know, in real life, you can literally click through one slice at a time, look for symmetry, check it all out, uh, and then carry it through into the other views. Custom sections I mentioned. So this is where we can basically, essentially in, in the in vivo software, what you do is you draw a line. Um, and that line essentially is really, you can imagine it if, if you were putting a um, an x-ray plate there, right? And then you can widen or narrow the, uh, the capture box, and that's going to tell you how much superimposition. So if you wanted to kind of look at the incisors, the you know maxillary or mandibular incisors and canines, and kind of recreate an occlusal radiograph, you can basically make your custom section, follow the long axis of the tooth, make it wide enough to include the whole tooth, and then you get this lovely custom section that really looks like a radiograph and allows you to evaluate bone height, root canal width, you know, and all those kind of things. And, and again, right, I mentioned we have Chevron sign, right? These these are not periapical lucencies. Um, they are Chevron signs. Um, so we have got to be aware of that. Same thing, we've kind of recreated the same view in the bottom. Um, because again, when you roll forward and back, the incisors kind of come through obliquely, so it's a little bit harder to evaluate their bone height, whereas a custom section is a great way to do that quickly. Um, the panoramic, right? Panoramics are great in people. We have this lovely um, round arch, which lends itself to, and then again, the panoramic radiograph has been a kind of a staple of human dentistry for a long time. And you can get a really good view of all the teeth and show it on one image. Um, the panoramic in the dog, you have to basically kind of draw the, the arch that you're um, that you're trying to create. And because of the shape of the dog's mouth, it, you're almost always going to get some sort of distortion usually of the incisors or the canines. And so again, I thought this was gonna be super useful and important, try to make this big perfect X-ray so you can interpret it just like, you know, a radiograph. Um, you can kind of, you know, you can play with the density and the color and the um, opaqueness and all those things. And it looks really cool, but a lot of distortion, right? This is not really ideal for interpretation. So. It makes some cool pictures, um, but um, I actually don't use it very often. Um, I would be—I would rather make like three separate flat custom sections if I wanted to have sort of a, a big, or just look at it in the 3D um, to get the same sort of effect. Um, so TMJ custom sections, these are pretty cool. Again, this is in Vivo's version. Other companies have different ones. So you've got a 3D. Um, and these are all like adjustable and customizable. I like to look at the TMJs from, from the back caudally. So there's the right TMJ, there's the left front in three dimensions. You can change the appearance and density. Um, on this view, we're kind of looking down and we've lined up on the TMJs. We've got symmetrical um, viewing boxes in, in these green lines. Each one of these green lines, re lines represents a cross section of that TMJ. So you're looking down on the TMJ you can evaluate how it looks, um, and then you can look at sort of the orthogonal view of it um, in sections, and so you literally have sections. And the really nice thing about custom sections is, you know, looking at a cone beam is a dynamic process, right? You're rolling and scrolling and looking at all these things, but being able to kind of grab individual images that kind of highlight all the information you want to share in a single image that you can then save and attach to a medical record or share with the client or share with a, another practitioner or just kind of keep in the record for your own reference without having to go and manipulate the whole study, um, really useful. And so figure out what kind of information you want to keep and you want to have at your fingertips and then make those custom sections and, and you know make a habit of saving them. Image capture, so saving images, um, is also a really useful thing and different softwares do it in different ways. Um, you want it to be quick and easy and convenient, right? You should be able to, every time you see something cool, you should be able to archive that and then share it with the client, share it with your coworkers, you know, put it in a lecture. Um, 
And so you want to, you know, get it, make it a JPEG or a TIFF or whatever your file format is. Um, and then you can share it, you can reference it. You know, a lot of times if you're sitting at your desk, you know, manipulating these images, you can save a bunch of JPEGs and then open them up chair side. You know, if you're manipulating a chair side, you can do it all there. These are big files. Um, even with good software, they're a little bit cumbersome to open and close. Um, we typically leave the software running on one computer and either export JPEGs to ChairSide or literally use um, Remote Desktop Viewer and just remote into the computer that's running the software from the ChairSide computer rather than opening and closing, you know, multiple copies of the scan. Um, and clients love these images. There's no blood in them. They look super cool. Um, the clients sort of get that perception of value of what you're doing. This is what you can offer that you know, most places don't offer, and this is what they're looking at. So um, I do a series of images for every patient that gets a comb beam, mostly in 3D, not because I need them or use them, but because the clients love them. Um, and it takes like three seconds to share them. Um, also nice, you know, if you, if you have to do a lecture or something like that, um, a lot of the images I showed you today are really just out of the client images files. I didn't have to re-render them. A lot of them we already had saved. So, um, so image capture is fun. Um, so I have a few clinical cases. I didn't know how long this was going to run. Um, and, um, most of them sort of highlight, um, you know, little tools and tricks and stuff like that. Um, so I'll go through them real quick. Um, and then, uh, we can get to a couple questions where we're almost out of time. This was a root canal recheck, um, that came in. So there's the original root canal. As it comes back a year later, and even on the radiograph, you can see it looks like that distal root has periapical pathology, so that root canal didn't go so well. Um, so we were using the um, custom sections to um, to make a measurement just for surgical planning, right? We're going to do an apicoectomy, so we need to kind of come down right on the tip of that root. I can measure, you know, the 20.2 millimeters. I can take an endo endodontic ruler, and I can literally put myself exactly at the tip of that root and that measurement is accurate and true, you know, to the almost 10th of a millimeter. So that's super cool. I'm also just looking at that, um, any question, you know, about is that a periapical lucency? We've got this big black space around the root, you know, and things like that. So, um, so we're able to very accurately do a surgical root canal, um, take out that infected apex um, and then, you know, refill it. Um, so that's a good use of measurements and custom sections. So that's kind of fun. Um, another clinical case. So this is an oncologic case. A nine-month-old female Doberman pincher with a rapidly growing mass. Um, her primary care had biopsied it and it came back as an atypical spindle cell proliferation. Um, it's not good when the dog is really young. The tumor is growing really fast and the pathologists are not sure what it is. Um, so... Grossly, this math doesn't look, you know, it's kind of smooth and, and regular. It doesn't look super scary, but this dog is young and it's growing really fast. Um, it's pretty big. Um, this is after it was biopsied. Um, and when we look at the, the cone beam, um, there's not a ton of bony changes, but they're there. They're subtle. Uh, it is changing the bone. You can see it, the soft tissue in the blue circle there. Uh, you can kind of see how big it is. But notably, look at the displacement of the teeth, right? The third premolars push forward. There's a big space there. So this 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 mass is, is physically moving the teeth. It's actually just taking up enough space. It's even tipping the lower fourth premolar buccally, um, just as sort of a, a space occupying. That's how fast it's growing. It's moving the other teeth. It's causing a lot of change. So this is a, you know, this is a scary tumor. Um, we want to get it out of there. Um, the, this arrow kind of points to, you know, again, some bony change, um, in the area of the, the, the around the fourth premolar. Um, so you can see the masses around the, the, uh, you know, the third and fourth premolar. Um, we've got abnormal, we've got soft tissue changes. And, and this is a great example of sort of scrolling back in the transverse. This was kind of the last, um, the last slice that I could see that soft tissue change. Um, and then I used it to look over here and see that, okay, we're right at the, at the distal aspect of the, um, of the first molar. Um, you know, we can look for bony changes elsewhere to kind of determine, you know, where this thing goes. So it goes almost all the way to the palatine artery. 
It is in the bone around the fourth premolar. It goes almost all the way to the end of the maxilla. Uh, and so we're going to have to do a pretty wide resection to get this thing out. So we went from the second premolar to the caudal extent of the maxilla. Uh, we went to the palatine artery and dorsally all the way up to include the infraorbital canal um, and to try to make sure that we got all the way around it um, because there was some concern that it was making its way into the infraorbital canal. So again, very long description is never a good thing when, when the pathologist, in this case, it was Dr. Bell, um, this thing doesn't have a name, but you know, I think it's, you know, she's seen it before. I think a, a bunch of people have seen these and these are, these are pretty scary. Um, and, um, so this is, um, a 3d rendition, uh, afterwards. And, um, so you can see the resection that was done. Um, and again, this sort of, you know, 3d kind of, it's after the fact, so it kind of tells us what we do. Um, this is a pretty big dog, so this actually had to, this was two scans, and you can see a little bit where it's stitched together. So this little line is where it was sort of digitally stitched together to kind of get, get you the whole head, but you can see the resection of where the uh, where the cuts were to remove the, uh, the bone and the tumor. Um, and we did get narrow and clean margins uh, on that one. And then, so that's what the, the closure looks like uh, with the tumor gone. And then that's the dog um, after recovery. Um, she went home the same day. Um, I think she ate dinner. Dogs are tough. And, um, you know, and did very well, recovered very quickly and, uh, and well. And then um, we're running a little bit over. So this is a trauma case. Um, so it's a little two-year-old dachshund that got bitten in the face by his housemate. housemate. Um, he had actually already broken his jaw once. He had broken a tooth the year before. Uh, and um, the person who had extracted that tooth, it wasn't me, um, had fractured uh, the jaw through the alveolus. Um, they got the tooth out. They did manage to get it to heal, um, uh, and, and it had finally healed, and the dog was doing well at the time of the, uh, the scrap with his housemate. So there he is on presentation. Uh, he had fractured maxilla and mandibles, uh, so he came in uh, with a muzzle to support. He was very sad. And then here he is. So again, another 3D rendering. So you can see the jaw fracture here. He's got multiple maxillary fractures. So you can see his whole nose is kind of is kind of shifted. You can see fractures right near the, the canine teeth and everything else. I thought for sure that we were gonna have to you know, root canal those canine teeth. Um, so we did a J wires uh, on the bottom, uh, wire and splint. So we sewed up the soft tissue defect, put a, J, a wire around, and then did just an acrylic splint on the top. So he's, he's got a mouthful of acrylic and wire. Um, he was also a class two malocclusion. So that actually helped. It was a little bit easier to kind of, his um, lower canines were hypo erupted or the one he had. Um, so we didn't have to worry too much about his occlusion. Um, he wore this for six weeks. This is him when he came back six weeks later um, with everything in place. So we also had an interosseous wire in the fracture. J splint, maxillary splint. Um, everything was nice and stable. Everything um, looked good. Oh, that one's supposed to turn. So there we are. And then all that appliance was uh, removed. And actually, um, at the time, the even though the canines were very close to the fractures, they they actually there was no evidence that they had become non-vital. So we need to recheck them, but we didn't do the root canals. Um, and so that one remains to be seen on whether those um, canine teeth are gonna make it. Um, so we'll, uh, uh, I actually need to get him back and follow up with that. So um, so those are some cases that kind of show the stuff in in, uh, in action. Um, and um, that is, I'd like to thank again, our sponsors. So Osteoid for hosting, Dental Focus, um, is actually where we buy our cone beams from. So Jim Merritt at Dental Focus, if you need equipment, um, he has been very helpful throughout this whole process with kind of getting us what I need, what we need and taking care of it. After the, the sale, um, you know, if you want to come and check us out at the Animal Dental Center, if you are a referring practitioner, we appreciate your referrals and are happy to have them. And then if you're in need of, um, you know, uh, training, uh, continue education, the Animal Dental Training Center uh, offers, you know, um, wet labs, uh, didactic lectures and all that kind of stuff.
Um, and so if you want to learn more, you can come and see me there. Um, check out our website, take a course uh, if you're interested. And um, if any of you are still there, because I've been talking you know, to myself for the last hour, if you're still listening, if you guys have questions, I am happy to try to answer them as best I can. And um, yeah, everybody's thanks for listening. there with us. <laughs> <laughs> That was great, Dr. Hutt. Thank you so much. I learned quite a bit. Uh, we do have a couple of questions. Um, someone was asking, what type of contrast do you use for your soft tissue scans? Yep. So we use the um, Omnipake, which was not available for a while. I guess it's back. There was some production issues um, for a while, but we are able to get it again. Uh, and typically we give, um, and there aren't any great, there are some studies ongoing, but not published um, on using contrast and comb beam. Uh, and the consensus that I got from talking to different people who've done it and from my experience doing it is we typically use um, the Omnipake and, you know, it's about a mil per pound of body weight. Um, and you want to give the injection as quickly as possible and you want to start the scan as soon as it's finished. Um, so you have a very short window um, to get the best resolution. So, um, and, and then of course we, you know, we keep them on fluids and all that kind of stuff to, to make sure that they properly flush out the, the contrast. So mil per pound and you want to, again, start the scan pretty much as soon as you finish the injection. Um, okay. And that seems to, to give us the best results. Awesome. Thank you. And we have another question. Do you do dental radiographs and CTs on all of your patients or how do you determine which one? Yeah. So, I mean, we definitely do dental radiographs on everyone still, um, even the ones that get CT. Um, and then right now we have four offices. Two of the offices have the cone beam CTs um, and two of the offices don't. So obviously the offices that we don't offer it, we don't do it. Um, I don't like working at those offices anymore because once you get used to having the cone beam, you want it all the time. And so we will do it. Generally, we've we've tried to price it where we kind of do it on every patient and it's not an onerous cost. So in the offices that have it, we try to do it on every patient and dental rads and kind of look at both. Um, and every now and then, honestly, I'll I'll skip the dental radiographs if it's, you know, if it's just horrible periodontal disease and we're 90 percent sure it's going to be total mouth extractions before we start we'll grab a cone beam and then just do you know post rads and things like that but most of the time we're trying to do both um it's kind of like i mean I, i'm old enough and i practice in general practice long enough to have done dentistry without dental radiographs i'm ashamed to admit that's you know i think a lot of people have been in that situation and when you get radiographs you find out all the stuff you were missing when you were just looking. And then, you know, when you get comb beam, you find out all the stuff that you weren't seeing on your dental radiographs. And so you don't know what you're missing until you start looking. Um, and, you know, these machines are not inexpensive. I mean, it's a, it's a big investment, but if you use it on every case and price it reasonably, you'll get good at it. It'll pay for itself and you'll do better medicine and, and give the patients better care. So, um, our goal, and, and we should have all four offices should have comb beam by next summer. We've had to rebuild two offices to make room for them. Um, our goal is to do comb beam on every patient every time, you know, with rare exceptions. Awesome. Thank you. Well, that's all the questions we have. I want to thank you again for putting on this presentation for us. Uh, it has been a pleasure working with you. Um, we want to thank everybody for attending this evening. We appreciate you taking the time out of your schedule to join us. I hope you found this content informative like I have. Um, be on the lookout for an email from Osteoid uh, within the next day or two. The email will contain a survey for CE submission requirement. Uh, so make sure you fill that out. We will also be including um, contact information for uh, Osteoid, Dental Focus, and Animal Dental Center in case you have any questions for any of our sponsors. Um, we have a special offer at Osteoid, and I know um, Jim Merritt also has some great options for solutions at Dental Focus as well. Um, and they do want me to uh, let you guys know that there is a wet lab at the Animal Dental Training Center coming up soon um, with both the Animal Dental Training Center and Dental Focus.
And that's all I have as well. Uh, thank you everyone for coming. Uh, we look forward to speaking to you soon. Make sure you respond to that email to get your CEs. And we look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you, right. Dr. Hutt. Yeah, thank you. And, and again, <laughs> thank you guys for, uh, for joining us this evening.